Hey, it's Mark Podolsky, the Land Geek, with your favorite niche real estate website, www.thelandgeek.com. And I'm really excited for today's guest. I was on his podcast, and um, he's just a great guy. But before we talk to our guest, I would be remiss if I didn't properly introduce my co-host, Scott Todd, from scotttodd.net, landmodo.com. And most importantly, if you're not automating your Craigslist postings, post and your Facebook postings, postingdomination.com forward slash the land geek. Scott Todd, are you ready for this podcast? I'm ready, Mark. Let's go. All right. Our guest is Jeff Nicholson. And Jeff has an interesting story. In late 2000, he suffered a bout of viral meningitis, which is the start of his journey through his own hell. He recovered, but within a year was struck again. This triggered a series of severe stress-related conditions that caused him to go to bed bound for years, sleeping almost 20 hours a day, like a, like a real-time like Rip Van Winkle, followed by a, a further four of being housebound. He struggled with depression, anxiety, guilt, and many other debilitating mental and physical conditions, including severe lethargy, chronic migraines, racking muscular pain, poor concentration, and memory. Now, 2006, his life gets better, and... Uh, Wait, no, he doesn't get that much better. Actually, he wants to kill himself. But then, <laughs> then it gets things, better. <laughs> okay, things do get better. And uh, he becomes a different person. He works with uh, you know, people all over the world, entrepreneur CEOs, other high-performing professionals through his coaching, mentoring, training, and speaking. Um, He's a big deal. Jeff Nicholson, welcome to the Art of Passive Income podcast. Thank you very much for having me. Uh, Scott, Mark, lovely, lovely to be on the show. All right. So I don't think I did your story much justice there. Um, kind of rewind, rewind, the, re, 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 can I even say it? Rewind the tape and uh, take us back to those dark days and, yeah, so and it, how you got out of it. Yeah, so it really, it really started. Um, I was never really good at dealing with the stress side of things, um, mainly because my belief was men don't talk about their issues; they keep it, you know, they keep it a secret and everything else. And I noticed in um, the year two thousand that I was ill a lot. I was having to be off work. I was getting viruses and all sorts of things. Um, and then all of a sudden, November the 5th, which in the UK, we celebrate Guy Fawkes Night, which is fireworks. Um, and I was rushed to hospital with um, viral meningitis, was spent 24 hours in the hospital, came out, thought everything was great, started to make some progress. Um, but then what, I, what we found out almost a year to the day, I was rushed to hospital again with the same, the same condition. And I spent four week, four sorry, five days in the infectious diseases ward in the hospital, which is no fun, Mark. I can tell you, um, it's like outbreak the film. With I was waiting for <laughs> Dustin Hoffman to run in with the monkey. Um, yeah, yeah, you know <laughs> that sort of thing. Um, and then what I then what I ended up doing was that I came out of hospital again. My wife had just had our second child, so we were trying to keep away. I was trying to keep away from him, so I didn't give him any bug because we didn't know what was going on. And then I started to notice that I was unable to really move around. I couldn't get from the bed to the bathroom. I couldn't walk downstairs. I, couldn't, I didn't have the energy or the capability to lift my head off the pillow. And as you said, it, when you talked about it, it, I spent a year sleeping about 20 to 22 hours a day. Um, didn't want to be around anyone, literally. Um, well, when you, spend, when you spend that length of time in bed, you, you know, you, your energy depletes anyway because you're not, you're not using anything, but I just sunk into depression. I had hyper anxiety, insomnia, all sorts of stuff going on. And when I did come out of that phase, I was then still ill, but I was able to move around a little bit more, but I needed a walking stick and whatever else. And I know I live in England and I don't live in the castle. I can assure you, um, not like all the rest of them, but right, right. to walk, to walk down the top of the stairs to the bottom of the stairs would literally take me half an hour. So wow. I got to the bottom of the stairs and I would have to rate, uh, rest for another half hour. And then I would walk to the hopefully crawl, walk, slide to the lounge. And then I would basically sit in the same place for the whole day and then repeat it day after day after day after day. And 
it was in January, January 2006, where I just got told that I could be ill with this for the next 30 years. And I've been, I've known my wife since I was a kid, since I was young, went probably to the same nursery, but I, but we'd been going out since I was six, she was 16. And I just looked and I went, I can't put my family through this anymore. I can't, I, I can't drag them down because I don't know what's going on. So what I, obviously the first thing that comes to mind is, is, well, I think I'll just end my life. That was the thing that came. It was the only solution I could see at that time. So I got in the car. I knew where I could do it. I knew I could get to 80 miles an hour. There was a big oak tree, seatbelt off. I knew that that's what would happen. But just before I got to that, just before the, the speedo's going up, and I'm as I'm driving there, I can, my eldest son, Will, I hear his voice in my head saying, Daddy, not now. And I kept hearing it, Daddy, not now, Daddy, not now. And it was almost like, the only way I can describe it is it was like an epiphany. And I kind of like came to, I guess, a moment of sanity and that moment of insanity. And I slid, skidded to the side of the road and I just screamed. And it was weird because it was almost like a flick of a switch and went, right, I need to know, I'm not going to be this person anymore. I'm not going to be this victim anymore. I need to know what moves people from as I call it now, desperation to inspiration. What is it that moves people from this dark spot to actually desire and want to create and live something amazing? Um, and that had been, that's been my mission ever since. Well, I've, I've got the chills, uh, Jeff. Scott Todd, what, what are you feeling, man? Man, I, I, can't, I can't even imagine what it would be like to be at that, at that spot, you know, like... Um, you know, it's, it's hard to even kind of put your brain around where, where you yeah. would be or, you know, kind of how, how deep you're in at that point mm. when you can't even relate to it. Mm. And how, how did you get from desperation to inspiration? I mean, what was that journey like? I mean, was it slow? Was it arduous? I mean, what did you have to go through to get out of that? Do you know what the there were certain parts that was extremely quick, um, and what I've what I've learned to discover was is that actually the body wants to recover very very quickly. The body and mind want to recover because, you know, ultimately we we have this we have what our head says, and then we have what our brain interprets and how that then affects how our body goes. So what I started to do is I started to look at all different. Um, therapies mainly because I didn't have much luck in the traditional medical um, routes. Their, their response was drugs, more drugs, and even more drugs. And unfortunately, the side effects sometimes were exactly the same as the symptoms. So you would go for, I don't know, let's say pain, but actually the medicine could cause anxiety or depression or weight gain. Well, I was already big because of my, what I was suffering from. So therefore, the last thing I needed was to do that. I remembered seeing a specialist and he told me that the reason I was um, miserable and um, he wanted to identify and his words were, I'm telling you now you're fat. And I was like, oh, great, thanks. And that just makes me feel so much good. I've just spent 300 pounds to see you. Um, so I really looked at all of that NLP, hypnotherapy, Reiki, um, you know, some of the Qigong and Tai Chi, some of that sort of stuff. But it was really the training program that really taught me about how our thoughts can influence our body and how fast our body can repair once it gets back to a, an equilibrium, once it gets back to a balance. And what I realized was, is, is once I started doing that training, as I started to, you know, educate, I had mantras, I had affirmations, I had journaling, I did all that sort of stuff. And as I was doing that, that's, I started to notice my energy, my uh, positivity, all of that. And actually not just go to where it was before I was ill, surpass where it was when, when I was, before I was ill. Um, and then I started to look at, you know, I trained with Jack Canfield. Up, I did a two-year, a, a one-year mentoring program with him. He handpicked 100 people from around the world, and I, I did that. I learned hypnotherapy because I was fascinated by language. Not about turning people into chickens, but you know, like, like the the um, the language side, um, and then that was my mission to initially start helping people with chronic fatigue, 
and, and really practice what I preach and practice what I teach. And what I realized was is, is that we all limit ourselves really in the same way of what we're thinking to actually what we're doing. And then it's a matter of helping people work on that. I mean, Jeff, like I, I try to do mindfulness meditation and I'll sit down mm-hmm. and I'll, I'll, I'll use the Headspace app. And I'm yeah. not joking. I'm not even exaggerating. I feel like 17 of the 20 minutes of my mind, I'm like I'm gone. Like, I'm like the thoughts, yeah. thoughts, thoughts. Like, yeah, yeah. And then something will happen. I'll have like this like, like very peaceful yeah. moment yeah. of following the breath. And yep. then, you know, thoughts. I mean, it's, I find it very difficult. I mean, Scott, yeah. do you have difficulty kind of like with the, with the mind kind of doing what the mind wants to do and, and not being in the present? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a pr- very common thing. I mean, the, the, the mind, it does have a mind of its own, right? Like it's, yeah. there's a reason that they say that. And I think that one of the, the key things that, you know, is really, can, can you, can you stop those, those, the, the mind, whether it's from wondering or, or kind of talking to you, telling you the stuff that you can't do to just say, damn it, I'm going to go do it. Yeah, you know, that's, that's a good question. And I think the, the, I think when you meditate, it's don't, don't believe the, the thing that says that you're supposed to go to a place where you don't think of anything because the brain doesn't work like that. You know, actually what's happening is, is when you're going into your meditative state, you're actually giving your mind a chance to go, let me just kind of like go through some stuff that I'm trying to process that probably doesn't get a chance to do when you're working and when you're doing everything else. So you're kind of like giving yourself, and sometimes those things that come in your mind when you're doing those meditations are those, you know, those great moments, those inspirational thoughts. And I actually, I, uh, I want those sort of things to come because that's allowing me to, my brain to allow, oops, Daisy, my brain allowed to play and allowed to do all of those, those things. So I think that's an important aspect. The other aspect is, is it's about, a lot of it's about the self-talk and how can we change the self-talk that's polluting or poisoning what we want to do and how we want to create success. And part of that, I think, is a morning ritual. You know, what do you, how do we do, what do we do in the morning that gets me to a place that goes, bring it on day because I'm ready for you. You know, ultimately at the high performance level, that's what we're wanting to do. And when I, when I started my recovery, I start to do this thing that basically I look, I go, go into the bathroom in the morning. I look at myself in the, in the bathroom every morning and I, and I've got this mantra that I say to myself, but words aren't just enough because we can say things without complete meaning. So it's a balance of posture, conviction, congruence, and pricking the white, the right words that are going to go, okay, I'm ready for the day. And I'll share this on the podcast and I share it with other people, but I always end it with, I love you at the end. Now I know that's soft and I know that's, you know, fluffy and all of that stuff. But if you don't learn to appreciate yourself, because I'm coming from a point where I hated myself enough to get in a car and go, that actual tree makes sense to me hitting that at 80 miles an hour. But when I can stand there and I can look at myself in a reflection, and when you look at yourself in the reflection, you see the true you. you don't, you're not just looking at anything. You're looking at you looking back, and you, you can see if it means something. You can see if your posture's right. You know, all of that sort of stuff has a huge impact on telling your body how you want to feel. So if you start the day, you know, like a complete A1, I'm going for it, but I understand that all of the 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 mindfulness set and everything else, but I have complete conviction and appreciation of myself, then you can start the day with this relentless um, strength that comes from me. No matter what people say, you just can go for the most amazing things that you can ever dream of. I, I love it. Um, you know, to play devil's advocate, right? Mm-hmm. And you're in the, this depressive state. and Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I don't think I'm very depressive, but I've read enough about it where it's just oh. so dark yeah. and, and people have a very difficult time, yeah. uh, getting out of it without some type of professional help or Absolutely. without some type of medication. Yeah. And so how, how does someone in that state 
you know, even have the energy or the wherewithal to, to have even a, 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 this positive sort of morning routine. Right. Well, okay. Cause you, th- there's a good thing. First of all, you have to go and seek help. You can't, you don't, don't think you can do it on your own because, um, um, there is, there is a thing that I have got, I've got a book somewhere where I've written down everything I thought about myself when I was ill, um, from fat, useless, stupid, um, a rubbish dad, um, all of those stuff. And I actually wrote a list of how bad I was as a person. So when you're going through that depression state, your filter is, I want to look for everything that's bad. You know, it's like, don't think of a pink elephant or don't think of how rubbish your life is, you know, and that's what comes up. So definitely seek um, talking, um, counseling or seek medical advice. And I do think there's a place for antidepressants. I think, if that, I think the biggest problem is, is when people think that they need to live by them because all you're actually doing is, is you're suppressing why it's called depression you're suppressing your emotions rather than expressing them so by getting something that gives you a little bit of a lull to be able to go okay now i feel comfortable enough to talk about something then that's what you need to do but talking about your issues is the best way to deal with stuff you know getting them out to someone that is prepared to listen without judgment because one of the hardest things are is when, you know, if you're having a bad day at work or you're having a bad day at something, let's not take it to depression. And you speak to someone that's emotionally attached to you. It's very hard to hear someone saying something to you. So by going and seeing a professional, whether it's a coach, a counselor or something, you, you're able to go there, speak to them and repair some of the stuff that's happened in the past, maybe. Or sometimes it's just about to change your focus and my um the way i used to describe is i lived life in the rear view mirror i wasn't taking any notice of what was happening possibility in the future i was always living in well everything's gone wrong in the past so therefore everything's going to go wrong in the future so i think there is that massive importance but also i went through a paradigm shift so when i was going to that moment there was a moment where i went there's nothing on this earth that's going to stop me from getting better so, cause at the time when I was driving towards the tree, then I was in that space. I was in going, nothing's going to get better. So therefore let's just finish it off. But with the help of my son, who thank God wasn't in the car, but from the help of him um, and his voice that jarred me enough to go, okay, regardless of what I need to do, what demons I have to confront, what limitations, what past beliefs I've got about myself is I need to get better. And then that spurred me on to try even harder, Mm. but also to look at all of the different possibilities of what is out there. And also not to be ashamed. I've gone through depression, you know, so what? It's not a sign of weakness. The problem is, is a lot of people are strong. And the reason is they suffer from depression because they don't want to burden other people from those issues. Or maybe they have got some mental chemistry issue and stuff, but that's what a professional is for to help you identify and to help you get that sorted. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Scott Todd, what are your thoughts? I mean, I think that, uh, I mean, I, the, the, the story here is so, so deep, right? Like, I mean, I think that any, any time that you're, you're looking like back at your life or you're, you, you know, you're looking at it from, you know, I, I like to think of it as kind of like a mood elevator, if you will. Like, you know, if you, if you just imagine like this glass elevator, and when you're, when you're at the lowest point, which is, you know, like, uh, I mean, what is the lowest point? Maybe it's, dri- it's driving your car 18 miles an hour towards a tree. Mm. Uh, but what emotion is it? It's, it's hopelessness. Mm. It's, it's, yeah. it's uh, you know, all of this stuff. Nothing ever goes right for me. You're deep in the basement of this glass elevator, man. Like, you know, like you're, you're, in, the, you're in the lowest of lowest floors. And all you see is like concrete walls and nothing is beautiful. But then as you rise on that elevator up and you become, you know, kind of curious, maybe that's halfway up the mood elevator. You're kind of curious about things. Hey, I wonder how that works. Or, hey, I just got cut off in traffic by this jerk. Man, I wonder if he's in a hurry to get to the hospital. Maybe something bad's important, right? Like yep. now all of a sudden, I'm not like, you know, lashing out at somebody. I'm more able to kind of be curious and more, um, I don't know, 
compassionate <laughs> about things so that it goes through. And then as I rise up, now I'm seeing the world through this glass elevator. Now I'm yeah. seeing things that I'm grateful for. And, you know, yeah. I, can, I can make better decisions because yeah. I'm, everything is clear. I get a bigger picture of the skyline. I can see the trees. It's just a much better picture. And so, you know, it's really, really hard to go from like that, that, that basement back up again. But I think that if you can just suspend like, okay, this is not a good time for me. I'm going to like suspend decision-making for right now mm -hmm. until I can get to at least to the point where I can be curious about something like you, like you were saying, mm -hmm. like, okay, well, I, I am going to change this or how can I change this? Mm -hmm. Once you became more curious about things, well, then the outlook was completely different. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, Jeff, I can imagine that you get a lot of emails, um, you know, where people are not in the best frame of mind. Is there a, a book or, uh, you know, a piece of art, or some type of music that you, you know, you gift or you recommend the most of? No, so, so you, there's a couple of things that you've, you've brought up. So what I would say is, is gratitude is probably one of the um, most powerful ways to re-tap into what actually is great about life. Because you, you're so right, Scott, when people are in that bad place, they just, they don't look at the right place. So what I would say is, is um, there's a great app called the five minute journal. Um, really simple. Um, it's a, it's a gr it's great. And there's the, and, but it gives you all of the steps to throw through about looking for something great in your life. Now, what I would say is, is what you've got to do is always choose something different. So three different things every single day, because I've got a wife and two kids. So there's three things straight away. But what is it about them that you are grateful for? So for example, it might be my youngest son's laugh because he laughs like Bluto. Um, you know, it might be something like that, or it might be I, I, I love the way that um, the passion that my other son has in his career that he wants to take up. And once you start getting into the use of that, then go smaller. So choose simpler things like, I love the fresh air on my face when I'm going for a walk in the morning. Because despite how bad things get, there's always the simple things. And as you, Scott, you eloquently put that about the elevator, and I, I may borrow that and steal that in the future. But as you use that, it is about taking that up and using that thing. Because the other thing that's different, when people are in the dark spot, they look down. They don't look up. And looking up is a postural change as well. So when you're looking up and looking at what's around you, all of a sudden there's the horizon looks wider. There's a, there's a different message that goes out to maybe the brain and all sorts of things. And there's a couple of stories of therapists telling people to walk home and look up and count the chimneys on the roofs and then feeling very different when they get back to their home because all of a sudden their attention is very different. It's, a, it's up and out rather than down into the ground. So I think for me, the big one is the five minute journal and practicing the gratitude. Yeah, I have the five minute journal app. So now I feel really good about myself. <laughs> five stars. Five stars. Five Jeff stars. Nicholson, that's right. So, you know, and you know, it's interesting. I mean, it's a very serious subject, hmm. but what, is uh, great about you, Jeff, and I don't know if it's coming through on, on this podcast, is how much joy and, and humor and levity uh, mm -hmm. you bring. And um, especially on your, own, on your own podcast, you're just, you're just having a great time. Yeah. And what I'd be interested in about is, um, were you always like that? And then, you know, you got sick and then it just kind of come back. I mean, is this something that is innate to you or have you developed? No, um, I wasn't very confident as a child. Um, I was bullied at three schools. Um, and I, the only, my only um, avenue to, for my confidence or to excel in something was sport. So um, it was whatever sport was out there I did because I loved the competitiveness and I loved the fact that I actually could do that. Stick me in a classroom and put me in front of some books because I'm dyslexic as well. And I just, my mind just melted. My, it literally came out my ears, that sort of thing. Um, when I, I think is, is when, I, when I've gone through my um, crucible moment and I've done my paradigm shift, I see really what's important. I look at things and go, 
I'm not supposed to have a miserable life. I'm not supposed to, and it doesn't matter whether you want to excel for a multi-million pound company to me or whether it depends on your own personal definition of success. For me, I just want to have fun. I want to be an example for my family. I want my kids to see that you don't have to go and do a job that you absolutely hate. You don't have to um, be angry all the time, which unfortunately they've seen that side of me when I, when I wasn't well. And I want them to be able to express. Now, I have to be an example to them, but I also have to be an example to others. And, you know, as far as I'm concerned, every person I meet is a, are a cool person and I want to get to know them. And the only way I can do that is being open myself because then it invites them to be open. And I'm, my whole business is talking, it's conversation. So if I cannot communicate and if I'm not in a good place, you know, I work with people who are burnt out. I work with people who are, the businesses are on the cusp of, you know, breakup and everything else. I've got to be at that high energy level to have fun. And no matter what, God forbid, touch wood and everything else, no matter what life will throw at me, I've been through worse than, you know, when people say, oh, my, you know, my career's at the end, it's not as bad as they initially think. It's just looking at them and going, okay, well, what can we do with this? And I'm, you know, I'm a solutions orientated. I used to always be problems orientated. And being solutions orientated, you get to see the horizon and you get to see, well, where is it that I'm wanting to go in my life? Where do I want to travel to? How do I want to do the business? And I don't believe in thinking small. I used to but I just don't. And if you're going to have a life, make it, as I say on my podcast, an exceptional one, you know, create the exceptional and be the exceptional. And that's where things will go. Yeah. I mean, you're like the British Tony Robbins. (laughs) Please market that one up. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and one of of his, his best quotes is suffering is an excessive focus on the self. And, and clearly, you know, it's your story is, is amazing, but Ultimately, at the end of it, it's about gratitude. It's about joy. Yeah. It's about creating this metric for success. And mm. it's not, you're not focusing just on your stuff. No. You're helping people and yeah. uh, you're rising up that mood elevator, like Scott said. Yeah. And because of that, you're able to, to achieve a purpose larger than yourself, which is yeah. you know, moving the needle in people's lives and, and helping yeah. them go through uh, the darkest of days because you've been there mm. and you can relate and uh, it's, it's really phenomenal, but uh, we're at that point now, Jeff, where we get to put you on the spot Uh and ask you for a tip of the week, a website, a resource, a book, something actionable where the art of passive income listeners can go right now, improve their businesses, improve their lives. What do you got? Okay. So it's not about the depression in the mood, but it's about productivity experiments. I see far too many people doing the same thing over and over again, expecting a different result. The tip is, is do a productivity experiments every quarter within your business and focus within a certain result that you're looking for and explore how you can make that as efficient as you possibly can. Can you give me an example of a productivity yeah, so for experiment? Example, so for example, let's say you, um, the, the famous one is, is I don't want to be working every hour God send in order to do, um, in order to work. Work doesn't have to be nine till nine, let's say for example. So it might be looking at systems as in um, something like using Zapier. There's an app for you that's a great way to look at your strategies and actually create workflows that actually make life easier because everything's done. And I introduced that to my business and I saved three hours a week on a strategy just on one part of my strategy and that was um a podcasting process side of it so using using apps and taking time to explore and be willing to change the things that you may have always done can save you huge amounts of time i love it and we love zap here we're we use that like every day yeah. uh, we're really geeky jeff oh i know uh, i mean well after your interview with me i've got text expander now You've got oh, me good. on that one now. So yeah, so. <laughs> See? Um, Scott Todd, what's your tip of the week? All right. So, so Jeff mentioned this guy, and I, I don't know if I've ever – I think in a way I think I've given this in the past, but you know what? I'm going to give it again, and here's the deal. Um, Jeff mentioned Jack Canfield, right? Like, and I think right. that Jack, uh, Jack Canfield is just a fantastic kind of uh, motivational person. 
But mm. there's one book that like he, he's the guy known for the chicken soup for the soul That's correct, uh, yeah. and those books. But there's one book, one book that I read that literally transformed the way that I think. And I think it has a lot to do with the success of where I am today. And that is the success principles. So yep. go get that book, the success principles, read it, read it again, read it again, execute on it. And uh, your life can be exactly what you want it to be. Yeah, totally agree. I listen to that every single year, at least once. It's wow. Great That's great. Well, my, my tip of the week is learn more about Jeff Nicholson um, at jeffnicholson.uk. I'll have a, a link to his website because it's arguably the worst domain name of all time because Jeff misspells his name. First of all, Jeff, no one can spell it. It's Geoff. It's G-E-O-F-F. Look, and we're, then, we're English. We got it first. That's I know, and then, and then you got Nicholson. I mean, come on, man. And then it's dot .uk. Who thinks of dot .uk? So I have to have a link to it um, yeah. so that anybody can find it. But uh, Yeah, I, people think I'm Dutch and all sorts when they first hear me. It's like, Geoff, Geoff, and I go, yeah, yeah. I'm Jeff. And they go, what? Okay. Right. So see, they had it first, and then we fixed yeah. it with the yeah. You know, exactly. We just fixed yeah. it. You J-E-F-F, are literally phonetics. I mean, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, 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 mean, I got to figure out a way to get across the pond and absolutely. have a pint with Jeff. Yeah, although he well, I'll get you one of the equivalent of your water bottle full of beer. Well, that that would be ridiculous. <laughs> I mean, this, you you can dock your jet ski in this water bottle. <laughs> this this water bottle's got an undertow. We can't buy them in this country. You cannot get them. You can't? No. no. Is, is there a water this, shortage? This, this is the biggest one you get. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> wow. Mark, it, not, not that this has to do with England, but it's, it's their, their, uh, you know, their, their neighbor, Ireland. I, I went to Ireland, and uh, holy cow, man, I'm, I'm asking for, like, Diet Coke, and they're bringing me, like, this small little Diet Coke, and I'm like, okay, we're going to need about 10 of those. Okay, like just keep them flowing. <laughs> yeah, I and then I'm like, can I please, please, please get some ice? And they're like, oh, yeah, yeah, here's two pieces. I'm like, no, no, you don't understand. I need ice, like lots of it. Like, can you just back the truck up for me? You know, and so then I got smart. I went to the gas station to buy them. And I'm like, this is ridiculous. You, this is more than, a, than the price of gas, this Diet Coke. Uh, come on. There's a reason why we think like that, though. Because in the, because in America when we when we've gone on holiday in America and you get a coat you get free refills, quite often in a lot of places yeah you will never yeah. get a free refill from a British restaurant. You so can't when they even get it. In, no, because when you big. get ice, because when they put ice in, you lose your drink, so you end right. up getting half water. You see, we're right. we're we're super efficient in the UK. We know what we want. <laughs> it, yeah, I mean, I'm sold. I'm a huge Anglophile now. Um, all right. I want to remind the listeners the only way we're going to get the quality of guests like a Jeff Nicholson from jeffnicholson.uk is if you do us three little favors, you got to subscribe, you got to rate, you got to review the podcast, send us a screenshot of that review to support at the We're going to send you for free the $97 passive income launch kit. Today's podcast is sponsored by landmodo.com. It is the best platform now to list your land listings and get them sold quickly and efficiently. Um, Jeff Nicholson, are we good? Yes, we are good. Thank you very much. And it's been an absolute pleasure in being on the show. It's great. And it's great seeing you again. Scott Todd, are we good? We're good. We're good, Mark. All right. Let freedom ring. Thanks, everybody.